Good morning all. Um, Rich, Liam, thank you for this great opportunity to come back to this conference this year in my new role. Um, I've realised talking to a number of colleagues around uh, the conference today, but also colleagues close to home in the technical authority, that nobody knows what I do, what my team does. I didn't know, actually, shouldn't be surprised. I didn't know until I started the role. So I'm here today to give you a bit of an insight into what a head of rail technology does, what our DNI is all about in network rail. And actually, um, I've got three key messages today I'd like you to try and remember and take away in a busy day. First of all, research, development, innovation is a team sport. And actually, we've got a, an RDNI program in Network Rail that is definitely not my program, absolutely not. It's not my boss's program, it should be your program as part of the track engineering community. The resource is there to help all of you find some solutions to those challenges we've talked extensively about already today. Second point is, there's bags of opportunity. I'm going to go into a bit of that in terms of the money that's sloshing around other parts of government and other parts of academia to help with some of these issues. So I don't think money's an issue. I know your precious time and resource and expertise is definitely an issue and there are plenty of other challenges, but the opportunity is there. And finally, my team and my wider colleagues in the Chief Technology Officer Group in Te Technical Authority, our job is to help you convert that opportunity to the solutions to your problems. So we need to be experts at RDNI as a process, not necessarily in the engineering aspect. We, we ought to be able to help you in terms of knowing what technology is on the horizon, but we're not here to kind of be the experts in asset management engineering. We need to know what your key issues are, help you write those problem statements so we can connect you with the opportunity and hopefully make lives a little bit easier in the future. So I thought I'd do some introductions first. This is my team. I report to Robert Ampoma, who most of you will remember from his uh, long years of service in various parts of track engineering and maintenance at NTA. I've got a, the delight of uh, managing the product acceptance team, everyone's favourite process, wherever I go. <laughs> Supply chain, inside network rail. Everyone loves it. Nothing wrong with it at all, is there? Um, my team, actually, they're, they're a really great bunch of guys. They work really hard to try and demystify the process. If you've got any queries about it, you can contact me afterwards or Roger Moore. Very happy to come and give you a little presentation or briefing on how to navigate the, uh, the really simple, straightforward, transparent process that's PA. I've got a head of, head of uh, comms or a, a, a comms manager. And we talked earlier about getting the good news out there about the kind of things that we, you're doing as a track engineering community. I think I can provide a bit of support there. So CARGE does a lot of work with colleagues in the research and development team to get these sort of events together. But we've got access to other forms of funding, publications, uh, routes to promote the, the good work that's going on. So really happy to kind of see what we can do to help there. Mark Gaddis. Um, international man of mystery to most people. This guy is actually an absolute genius at his job, which is going out and finding opportunities to get co-funding or third-party funding to support our research and development. He's leaving in June. I've got to replace him. I don't know how I'm going to do that, um, but that's one of our big challenges. And then James Heslop, my head of strategy, and I'll just click on a, a slide. Uh, I'll come back to that one. In terms of my role and James's role, these are kind of the key elements of it. But really, it's all about connecting you, connecting other parts of network rail. So we cover all aspects of network rail in terms of uh, functions, regions, and disciplines with those opportunities. We've got to be a bit disruptive, so we need to look further forward, look what technology is developing on the horizon, and then present that back to the business to say, we think we can connect you with some of these opportunities that help solve some of those challenges. Um, the middle column, the bottom part, that is really key for me. We're here about brokering those opportunities for funding, for resource, to connect with those problem statements. And then the final column in this slide, promotion. So yeah, really key, we get the message out there. It supports our, our reputation with government, with funders, with the regulator, and allows us to, uh, to build a kind of confidence in the way as a, an organisation we're adopting new technology and, and moving further forward in terms of addressing those challenges that we spoke about earlier. 
I'll come back to product acceptance, a bit about what it is. It is a key process, assures network rail that the products that are introduced to the railway, the control products defined by the um, technical heads and technical authority, are all those things there. So they're introduced in a way that doesn't disrupt the safe operation of the railway. Key points are that every application must have a business sponsor, and that is quite a commitment. It's not just someone um, to, to sign a few bits of paper. That sponsor actually has to work with whoever the applicant is to make sure the right evidence is presented to allow that product to be uh, assessed as whether it is all those things A to E. And the certificates are signed off by the technical heads, as you probably know. Right, let me move on. Rich said you've got 30 minutes, and I said, OK, is that 15 of present, pre presentations then and 15 of Q&A? And he said, no, that's 30 minutes of presentation. I thought, flip me. Um, so a little bit of a quiz. I'm doing it the old-fashioned way. One of the pitfalls of submitting your presentation last minute is you don't get to play around with Slido. So question one, how much R&D funding do you think Network Rail was awarded in CP6 by the regulator? And a clue is it's not D. I included D because one of my new colleagues keeps saying, oh, it doesn't matter if we just get £4.20 in CP7, we can still, you know, make some good progress. And I have to keep telling him that's not the attitude. So um, hands up if you think it's A, that we had £145 million of funding. Oh, got a taker at the back there, a couple down here. What about B, £245 million. Oh, yeah, many more of you here. What about C, £345 million. Very good. Well, the majority of you are correct. £245 million of funding. Massive amount of money. And we've supplemented that by £63 million of co-funding from a variety of sources that I'll come on to. Um, CP7, I can now pretty much confidently say, will be pitching for £165 million of funding. So a substantial cut, but the right thing to do relative to all the other financial challenges the railway's facing. We heard about some earlier as well. Still a huge amount of money, still massive opportunity, and we're targeting £70 million of co-funding to top that up and leverage uh, what we do. But a question mark I've got is, what else is squirreled away in the regional funding? It's not necessarily obvious in some of the regional CP7 plans, but I know it's there. And actually, working together with this sort of national pot and the co-funding, we can probably... You know, the, the totality is greater than the sum of the parts, if I get that right. Um, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's see if we can collaborate and, uh, and work on these programmes together. Question two, what does the term rural stand for? So, is it rail invention readiness level A, rail innovation readiness level B, rail industry readiness level C, or rolling in real loot D? <laughs> so, A, anyone for A? Hands up if you think it's A. Nobody. I might be too good at this. What about B? Anyone think it's B? A couple of takers. What about C? Oh, this is great news. I can, I can give up now. Anyone think it's D? <laughs> Jay, I don't think it's D. <laughs> it's D. We need to go for the ethics. <laughs> it is C, rail industry readiness level. I've summarised them on the left there. So this is the framework we use to assess how ready an idea is to take through into our business and implement day to day. We have a panel that looks at the ideas and assesses them. It's an area where we need to get stronger because we're not actually testing all the dimensions which are on the right of the slide. It's more than just technology readiness. It's about how ready the business is to adopt a new idea, how ready that idea is to be integrated into the rest of what we do. Um, have we got a route to market? So have we covered off the procurement angle on that idea? Can we go and buy it if we develop it? All those sorts of things. So it's an area where we're looking to strengthen the process without making it too onerous uh, in the next control period. And then finally, our suppliers. Loads of money out there for innovation. What do they say is the biggest barrier to them investing? So anyone for A, sponsorship? Nobody, okay. B, procurement. Some takers here. C, standards. Or D, our old friend, product acceptance. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm glad to say this case, um, it's not quite right. It's procurement, they suggest. However, all those four are their top four bugbears. We're dealing with network rail on innovation. 
So we've got work to do on all those fronts. So a bit about CP7. CP6, we went into CP6, the regulator said, I want to know how you're spending every penny of your R&D budget, down to the, you know, 0.001 pence. And we came up with a massive list of projects that we tried to prioritise with stakeholder engagement. And then it's not really worked out like that because you need a bit of flexibility in the programme. So CP7 is all about being more flexible, having a bit of float, allowing new ideas to come into the pipeline uh, and actually getting better at stopping some of the projects if they're not bearing fruit. Um, we've been asked to make sure that our plan is financially responsible, so it's about driving cost out of network rail, delivering returns in the control period, so I'll come on to what's coming in C working its way through in CP6, and funding to make sure we can continue adopting that through things like the first-in-class programme. Really important, though, it's priority-led, so it's your priorities have to drive this programme. Um, which means that the kind of commitment we're asking for is all those aspects of sponsorship, commitment to investing in ideas should they start to bear fruit, commitment to adopting the new technologies and new knowledge that's generated through the programme, so making sure this is focused all the way through to the end point of deployment. So we achieve NetRL's business goals, and then my team do a bit of a job with our external stakeholders, making sure they can see the line of sight through to government objectives, through to the rail technical strategy, etc. Again, just to give them confidence that we're spending taxpayers' money uh, carefully and there's been value for money for it through the research and development. To help this, we've developed these, on the left, these eight business-led themes with our SSB because we've been asked to make sure that whatever we're doing and whatever RSSB is spending money on, there's a clear line of sight to we're not duplicating effort. We, we clearly understand who's leading, who's supporting in certain areas, and also the line of sight back to the rail technical strategy, and I'll come on to that a bit later. So these themes, I'll just display them slightly differently. Eight themes, 49 capabilities, targeting not specific technologies, but just some of those future capabilities the industry thinks it needs to develop. And actually, these aren't too different from what's in previous iterations of the rail technical strategy. And that's one of my bugbears, is every five years we seem to have to reinvent this particular framework when it should be a continuum. These things don't change much. We just maybe refocus our priorities. But actually, from CP7 to CP8 to CP9, I'd like us to just have a research and development plan that spans the ages. And actually, CP8 R&D planning will just be pressing a button on the date we need to submit and out spits the list of prioritised programmes with everyone's support. In these areas, as Network Rail, from all the feedback we've had from regions, functions and disciplines, we think we'll be leading the R&D for the industry in themes 5, 6 and 7, which probably shouldn't be too surprising. We think we'll be partnering strongly in themes 4, 5 and 8, and we think we'll be leaving it to others to lead and put in most of the horsepower under themes one and two. Again, partly shaped by a more limited R&D budget and having to carefully prioritise where everyone's efforts go. In terms of those eight themes and that £165 million, this is a likely allocation of that budget across those themes. So again, probably not too much of a surprise, but theme seven optimise resilient assets, builds in weather resilience, builds in um, some of the sort of remote monitoring requirements, builds in some work to address obsolescence risk around our assets. We've got the biggest level of spend. And five and six as well, digital signalling, more automation of processes, significant spend. But we're also trying to carve out some um, investment in things like digitalisation and data, where there's more of a strategic element to our R&D programme required. And then we're looking at different ways of delivering some of the R&D as well. So you may have heard of first-in-class funding. The Felix is a robot that's in the, uh, one of the display rooms. It's a great example of where CP6 R&D funding is being used to take the idea from uh, a an operational concept to properly embedded in a limited way into our business as usual. And so because of the focus on delivering returns in CP7 from the investment, 
we expect around about 35% of the budget to be focused on taking high redness level ideas and adopting them in parts of the business. That doesn't need to be ideas that have worked their way through our entire R&D process as routes and regions. You can, you can come up with ideas yourself. You might have seen something that's pretty close to being ready to deploy in the railway. And this funding is there to help take it that last step as the, uh, as the operational trial, BAU. Deployment that gives everyone confidence that idea delivers the business benefits that everyone thinks it does and provides the, the playbook or the, the, all of the elements uh, documented that show others how to adopt the same idea with success in their part of Network Rail. There's also a lot of um, funding here that might be directed towards these partnering opportunities. So whether that's in the UK, whether that's across Europe, further afield, taking cognizance of what's been said already today about needing to learn from others and making sure we keep up to date with, with what's happening in Europe and further afield in terms of their knowledge of better ways of working in maintenance or renewals uh, for, for track. So a bit about how to access the funding. Slightly simplified perhaps, but let's say you've got an idea. There is a group of people called the Track ALG, um, which is uh, your regional track engineers and John Edgeley and our uh, heads of S&C and track, Rob Lacey and Steve Franklin, that discuss these ideas, give them a bit of a technical peer review. But if supported, we'll take those ideas forward then to our national R&D board for financial approval. Yes, there's an investment panel step on the end, but provided it's got the, an idea has got the approval of those first two stages, the investment panel should be relatively straightforward. Robert and Poma's team have pro program managers, project managers who can help you navigate that process, can do all the legwork to make sure that idea at least gets to the various stages of this process. So Tom Edge for track is your program manager. Uh, and Daisy and Johnny and Greg are our three project managers. They're all there to help you. If you generate some ideas, you've got a problem that you need to solve, take that through this process. Now, a word of warning, once the project starts, things do get more complicated. It can get uh, less transparent about how to take an idea through the various rail industry red readiness levels, but that's something that we're working on to try and demystify that part of the process too. So the R&D process, I just wanted to highlight here really that there are a number of inputs, but I think what we're looking to change a little bit in CP7 is taking a more strategic approach to our R&D program. It feels like we've got loads of projects going on, but there's a slightly scattergun approach to how those actually align with your wider business requirements, both short, medium and long term. So we'll do a bit of that work. But I think what I'm really, really keen we also support you with is a bit of benchmarking. So you can send us kind of some of these problem statements, my team, Robert's wider team, will go off and do some benchmarking as to who else is using that tech, um, who else has got those challenges, what kind of technology they're using, where are the opportunities to do a bit of technology transfer, or just a bit of knowledge share and learning, because there's so much of that outlet, opportunity out there. Let me move on. In terms of content then, I wanted to highlight some of the R&D products, as uh, colleagues of mine call them, that are available now across all of the assets. So here they are on screen. In terms of track, the R&D fund has, uh, has sponsored and, and helped produce changes to our cast crossings, for example. It's sponsored a bit of work on artificial intelligence and the PLPR system. More work potentially to be done there. But there are also, um, we talked a bit about planning and access earlier. Some of our alliances have looked into 4D modeling of uh, planning processes, so that sort of time and motion planning of, of renewals. Uh, we've got new materials, new technologies in terms of designs like the Flow Footbridge, which is designed to provide a lower cost, lower carbon alternative to level crossings. So I think there's opportunity in here to take some of this technology and transfer it into the world of track. And again, it's Robert's team's job, my team's job, to look for those opportunities and come and present them to you and say, does this fit your requirements? Is this something that you know, 
we could make work. These are some of the products entering this first-in-class deployment phase. So Felix is at the bottom right there. Um, we've got other, you'll see the um, bottom left, this intelligent asset health monitoring. There's a stand in the, uh, one of the exhibition spaces on this, which is uh, more technology to understand um, on a continuous remote monitoring basis the condition of some of our structural assets, potential to be deployed across a range of assets, not just the uh, station portfolio at the moment. Panoptic bridge management. This is flying a drone around our, around our structures, capturing the video technology and artificial intelligence, highlighting defects for engineers to then make some decisions on. As you'll see, in the world of track, and, in the world of track a number of future requirements essentially rely on the same kind of process. Go monitor something, capture the data, a bit of clever analytics to filter down to the key points, and then present that to engineers to make the value-adding decisions. So plenty of opportunity there for technology transfer. So over the last 18 months, um, my new team has been collecting requirements from the track community on R&D and CP7. And here is the first summary of those requirements. Now on the left, probably not surprisingly, there's a lot of emphasis on more train-borne inspection, not just the yellow fleet, as I put there, but in-service monitoring as well. But I could have put a drone in there, as a picture of a drone in there. There's a lot of uh, emphasis on aerial drones to capture certain aspects of, of the asset, to replace certain aspects of manual inspection. At the kind of more blue sky end of the work, the rail stress measurement, so uh, still a requirement to look into, can we non-destructively test the condition of rail stress? I know it's quite a challenging technical project. But not surprising, you know, more train-borne measurement, but all of that will rely on or produce more data. We need to know how we're going to capture that data, how we're going to store it. We need to be able to align it so that you can have confidence that all these data sets build up a, uh, a picture which you can have confidence in about the, the root cause of certain faults on the asset. On the right, remote condition monitoring. Fewer sort of applications emerging immediately, but certainly a... a a need emerging from conversations to have more of a strategic view of this in terms of track engineering. So what is it we want to measure? What kind of parameters? What level of accuracy? What level of reliability? How do we look after the remote monitoring itself so it doesn't fail? All that kind of good stuff. And I know there's some really great work going on with hot, hot weather monitoring, um, which was started probably 18 months or so ago, um, to look at ways we can automate some of the roles that the hot weather watch person does. Not surprisingly, very much an emphasis on decarbonisation and weather resilience, as we've already heard. So that's good news that some of the priorities making their way through to the CP7 programme are targeting those challenges. I know already, as John said, track is leading the way on decarbonisation of assets. There's some great work going on in terms of concrete sleepers, um, composite sleepers. We're actually leading the way in terms of other sister organisations around uh, the uh, kind of cross-sector view, National Highways, HS2, are behind us in this space. So the work that you're doing as a track group there is, is, is definitely forging ahead of many others. In terms of data management, so on the, on the right, as I've alluded to, there are opportunities being highlighted through the, the conversations we're having to introduce more automated processing of different data streams, whether that's video, which is a common theme across a lot of the disciplines, um, whether that's some of our more conventional means of uh, data sources. And then how do we use that data to make sure that some of our analysis and risk man management is improved? So further development of TrackX, for example, is on the cards. Um, and gauging itself, so continuing the work on gauging. And finally, in terms of plant, there's quite a strong push from the alliance world from capital delivery to look at ways we can improve our renewals process. So how do we automate more of that process? The regional engineers have highlighted the challenges with high output equipment and what options are there to develop a renewals capability that aligns with our 
railway and the access that we get to renew it. So those are kind of the, the main things emerging from the requirements we've captured around track engineering in network rail. They'll be taken to the ALG shortly for a further test, and further prioritization. Um, but the idea will be once this kind of uh, set of themes are agreed, then our mobilization team for CP7 will help parts of the business write the requirements, the remits for these projects, and they'll enter uh, the, uh, the pipeline and get funding in CP7. But what else might shape our DNI? I thought I'd have a look at this. We've got a rail technical strategy across industry. It doesn't need to change. It's, it's got a kind of a sound vision, and, and, and these are the five goals, and then in the detail are the kind of vision statements for a 2040 railway. I've not had too many people disagree with this, but what there is is a, is a yawning gap between where we are today and how the industry has plotted a course to that vision. So we want to try and address that as far as we can um, and understand what that course might look like so that it might give us a better idea in terms of that continuity of R&D, where we put our efforts and how we demonstrate to uh, the government and, and the regulator that we have got a long-term plan and, and there is sort of a, a definitely a course that we're plotting. I won't major too much on this because it's been talked extensively about this morning, but I'd like to understand from you all the challenges that have been raised and the questions and, and the previous speakers, how you want to feed that into this opportunity to invest a little bit in innovation, in ways of working, as well as some of the products and, and, uh, and technology we use. It's not just about the, the bits of kit, this program. It's about the ways of working as well and the knowledge that helps change some of that. I thought a bit about one of my old chestnuts, the bow tie. So I think this is where research is great. If we, do we know enough about the failure modes? Do we know enough about how those failure modes change with our future environmental challenges, for example? Research is brilliant at identifying um, and investigating some of those kind of problems. We're doing a lot of research with universities, I know, as a track group, into things like lateral stability of, of our existing sleeper designs which will then allow us to redefine some of our risk bow ties and other risk controls. There's great work going on looking at curving rules, for example, and the assumptions in standards around curving rules, which are, you know, predate modern rolling stock by many, many years. So let's test those assumptions again. And, uh, and, and the last example I'm aware of is work going on looking at our track geometry intervention thresholds and, and, uh, and response timescales. Again, because we've got new technology to try and analyze the failure mode and decide whether those controls are the right controls for us in future. I think too often we tend to jump to a bit of technology that, on one of those controls as the solution, perhaps not understanding the, the, the problem as well in the first place. Well, that's good. It's stuck on that one. If I run out of time, Rich. Okay, uh, where are we? Last one then. More opportunities. These are some of the organisations I now work with in my new team. As Network Rail, we spend about £10 million a year with Ukraine universities. There is a framework agreement. Please come and tap into it. We, if you've got problems you want researching, my team, Robert's team, can help you get some funding, can help you access the right expertise uh, to, to look into that research. Connected Places Catapult, Manufacturing Technology Centre, organisations we sponsor, we subscribe to, that give us access to experts in some of these technologies. So, again, hopefully we can help you target some of that resource at the right opportunities. ProRail, so back to some of the European contacts. Just been talking to ProRail about S&C measurement from a train. They've been doing it for years. They measure 4,500 switches twice a year with an inspection train. Masses of learning there. If we want to introduce the same sort of technology, we can build on. We can go and see their train. We can go and look at their uh, user interfaces and see if it's the, thing, the kind of thing we want or how we adapt that for, for net, network rail use. And, yeah, a bunch of other things going on, but there's, like I said, huge opportunity out there, masses of expertise, loads of money sloshing around some of these organisations. Um, I want to help you access some of that to address some of the challenges you've talked about. Last slide. Those three messages, 
my team are here to help, loads of opportunity, it should be your program, I don't want to kind of define the program for you, but I want to make it work for you. Thanks. <laughs>